theory on the swampland. <coughs> Okay, first of all, I like to thank um, the organizers for putting together this very nice uh, conference and also for inviting me to speak here and to present the work. Uh, unfortunately, I had to shift a little bit the talk because I uh, had some health issues in the beginning. Um, so what I will uh, talk about uh, in the following half an hour is uh, some recent paper with Aaron Palti and Irene Valenzuela. Uh, this work is about uh, field distances and uh, uh, the so-called swampland distance conjecture. And I put F-theory in the title to also have it uh, featured uh, prominently. But we will see, uh, we will be mostly working in a type 2B setting. Let me start with some introductory uh, comments. Well, I don't have to say too much that uh, it is an exciting question to ask uh, if quantum gravity can tell us about uh, what kind of uh, effective theories one can actually uh, realize. So, or in other words, to ask, uh, which effective theories can be consistently coupled to quantum gravity, and then in the other way around, ask if this helps us to somehow see the imprints of the underlying theory. So some picture which we have seen already yesterday is uh, one way to, to think about such a situation is to look at two sets of theories, namely one set of theories which are apparently consistent theories, uh, which where we take in all known uh, constraints like anomalies and so on, and then ask, is the set of theories as big as the, uh, the set of theories which can be consistently coupled to quantum gravity, for example, to string theory? And in, uh, in the ideal situation to actually find some interesting new structures, you hope that this set is smaller and that one kind of finds constraints which uh, distinguishes them from a theory which you just naively write down without thinking about such constraints. Uh, we have heard the names for these, you, one might like them or not, but uh, this is uh, sometimes called the string theory landscape, and uh, um, this is uh, called the swampland, so to say the theories which are not nicely coupled to uh, string theory or quantum gravity. One prominent example that such a kind of distinction of imposing constraints from, from the quantum theory is, of course, uh, the study of, uh, we know very well from the study of anomalies. Uh, anomalies have to be cancelled at all energy scales, and there's an anomaly matching conditions. And uh, the, uh, what I talked about uh, uh, last, year, last year in this conference uh, when we think about these anomalies in, uh, uh, in F-theory, for example, anomalies are very much linked to a detailed study of, uh, of the geometry. So in some sense, the, in, in string theory, quantum uh, constraints and the features, of, or the, uh, the features of the geometries are closely linked. Yeah? In, in, in this case here, uh, essentially, it was the statement that um, if a smooth geometry exists, then the smooth geometry effectively integrates out at one loop level um, certain states. And this information tells you about uh, the fact that anomalies are consistently um, cancelled. But anomalies are something... Uh, which have not necessarily to do with quantum gravity or have nothing to do with quantum gravity. So let us go one step further from this and ask if we can also uh, think about uh, quantum gravity constraints in a similar uh, fashion by relating things to geometry. So first I should state, of course, that's a very active field. I cannot do justice to that. I'm also not... Uh, uh, um, working on this subject for a long time, but you have clearly realized that in the last years, last many years, uh, 
many people worked on the uh, con conjectures which kind of uh, ca try to summarize what quantum gravity could impose uh, on the uh, on on theories. For example, uh, it is conjectured that. Uh, in the theory of quantum gravity, you don't have uh, global symmetries, that all of them are engaged eventually. Or a famous conjecture, which uh, clearly everyone has heard about, is the so-called weak gravity conjecture, which roughly states that gravity is the weakest force, at least for some one particle. The uh, conjectures relevant here uh, will be uh, the so-called swampland conjectures. They, they were formulated uh, some back in a paper by uh, uh, Oguri and Waffa and later refined some uh, uh, years ago. And um, they are based on, well, we have the author here, so I have to, they were based on simple examples, but very good intuitive guesses. Yeah, And uh, um, this will be also the focus of uh, this talk, and we will actually look at one of these conjectures in detail, and will impose or will look at tests which are much more sophisticated, and we will realize that these conjectures uh, still hold true, and actually they hold true in a very uh, remarkable sense. So what's the conjecture we will be looking at? Uh, uh, we call this conjecture swampland distance conjecture just to give it a bit more flavor about which one we mean because in the original paper there were several conjectures. Um, well, it is the statement that when I look at an effective theory and you, you vary some field, you can only do that over finite uh, proper distances because if you're trying to do that over infinite distances, actually something... Uh, uh, something drastic has to happen, namely that uh, there is an infinite tower of states becoming exponentially light. Right? So, so every theory which uh, is consistently coupled, can be consistently coupled to quantum gravity should have such a feature, otherwise there is something sick. Since we are uh, at such a F-theory conference, and uh, as you will see it, We'll get more mathematical. I have to, I have to state this a little bit more precisely. So let's, uh, let's imagine we are in some moduli space. That's our moduli space. And then we have points P and Q. And we look at, uh, in effective theory at the point Q. And we want to move to another point P, which is at some geodesic distance away, uh, from this other point. So I denote the distance by D. Okay. And the statement now is that uh, if this distance actually is infinite, like this geodesic distance is infinite, then an infinite number of states will become light, if I try to approach the other theory. It actually, be they become exponentially light, so the typical mass scales of at the two uh, points, they uh, behave exponentially with the distance. And it actually signals a breakdown of the effective uh, theory at this, uh, at this infinite distance point. Okay. So that's the more precise uh, formulation. So what is the idea? The, <clears throat> the idea is that let's, let's inst instead of uh, kind of uh, looking at some uh, very specific example, let's try to find some example where we learned a lot about it in the, in the last 20, 30 years, when we have really uh, strong mathematical tools and also a deep physical understanding of how to treat such situations. And that's why we picked uh, type 2B compactification, so F-theory compactification. Yeah. At the moment, uh, in our paper, most of this discussion is on Calabiao three-folds, but as you will see, the mathematical results, they equally hold for Calabiao four-folds or K3 or many other spaces, actually. So we want to study this distance conjecture and the B compactification on Calabiao three-folds. And the idea is we look at the complex structure moduli space of these geometries. Right? This complex structure moduli space has of course, been studied uh, to great detail. And it is a famous result that this complex structure moduli space contains some stringy physics. 
right? Why is it a famous result? Well, for example, recall near the conifold, uh, 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 the famous Strominger result is that the, the periods near the conifold actually automatically integrate out uh, a, a debrained state, a light debrained state. Okay, so it knows a lot, something about the states of the theory. Okay. In particular, however, we can also get detailed information about distances, and especially about infinite distances, as you see in a moment. Mo furthermore, in complex structure modulized space, the BPS states on Calabi-Yau threefolds have been studied to a large extent. So there's a vast literature on this uh, subject, and uh, we understand a lot how to treat them. In particular, we understand how their masses behave. We, we know um, their masses are given by the central charge because of supersymmetry. And what we will see in, is that we indeed can detect this exponential behavior, which the uh, swampland distance conjecture uh, suggests. Just to already give you some uh, interesting results, in case I don't have too much time at the end, this detailed study actually allows us to formulate kind of an observation, or if you want to be a bit more bold, another conjecture. Uh, but what is the statement of this uh, conjecture is that, that actually these two phenomena are not just um, related, they are actually uh, one causes the other. You can think of it as one causing the other. In other words, one can show, and we will, show, uh, we will see that in a moment, one can see that this infinite distance behavior looks exactly as if I would have integrated out infinitely many states. So it's kind of uh, the existence of an infinite distance point is an emergent phenomenon of having um, uh, integrated out infinitely many states. Uh, that, if true, that's quite a remarkable statement. Uh, I should stress, we perform very detailed checks in, uh, with quite sophisticated mathematics, but it still remains to test if this is true more generally. Yeah, and there are many situations where one could try to check it. Okay, so, so what's the kind of picture emerging when we look at the complex structure moduli space or this Calabi-Yau threefold compactifications? Actually, we find that several concepts come together in a very elegant way, namely infinite distances, infinite towers of exponentially massless states. Something which I also will uh, show you uh, momentarily is Global symmetry, the existence of global symmetries is tightly linked to the existence of an infinite, uh, in an infinite distance, and small gauge coupling function. And the unifying uh, uh, concept of all of this, which kind of ties this together, and that's an, a nice thing to present on a, an F theory conference, is the concept of having uh, monodromies and how to work with monodromies uh, in order to analyze uh, the situation. Okay, so now let's see how these individual concepts come about. I'm still looking for a clock. Okay. okay, infinite distances. So why is the complex structure modelized space so nice? Well, because we can actually measure distances very explicitly. Why? Because we know the metric on the complex structure modelized space. Well, a distance is just given like this. You just pick a path between two points, P and Q, and then the metric which appears here is the so-called Weil-Patterson metric, uh, for which are given by, for a Calabi-Yau manifold in the following way. It, it's obtained as a derivative of some Kähler potential, and this Kähler potential depends on the holomorphic D0 form. Of course, all of you have uh, seen uh, this expression. Uh, that means we can express the Kähler potential it's in, 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 uh, in terms of a holomorphic function. These holomorphic functions, they are called the, the periods of the, of the D0 form. And there are methods to computing them. 
Yeah, so for every given color we yell, you can write down differential equation and you can try to solve them. But that wouldn't be enough for us, right? Because that would mean I pick a color we yell, I compute the periods, I compute distances, and then I find something. Of course, that could be a feature of this, of this manifold. Okay, so that's not enough. But as we will see in a moment, there are strong theorems which are hold generally. So namely, we ask, what are the points P which are actually at infinite distances? So how does the complex structure moduli space look like? It looks like something like this. Okay, you have some moduli space, but then you have degeneration loci. These degeneration loci are the loci where the color BL threefold degenerates. Again, to make contact with maybe our experience of, uh, about F-theory, you can think of this as the base of an elliptic vibration, and these degeneration loci are the loci where the, the, the two torus degenerates. Here it's much more sophisticated because the complete Abiyao threefold degenerates. But these are divisors inside this higher dimensional moduli space. So let us denote this divisor, one of these divisors by z equal to zero. We pick coordinates when we want to walk towards this uh, one divisor. Well, as for seven brains, when you go around these singular devices, you have something uh, which is called monodromy, and this monodromy acts on these periods, so on this three, com uh, on this uh, d comma zero form in a specific way. So you walk around it, and then these rotate by a matrix. Now, a first result, the first uh, uh, easy to check result is that. A point can only be at infinite distance in moduli space if it lies on one of these singular devices. So if, you, if I just pick any two points which are not on these singular devices, they're always at finite distance to each other. So you have to pick one of them on, a, uh, on these devices, say at the z equal to zero, uh, uh, zero uh, divisor. Next, I will introduce the mathematics to study um, the distances. And the, the underlying big theorem which we are using, or one of the big theorems, is the so-called nilpotent orbit theorem. Okay, what does this state? Well, it gives us a local form of these periods, of these pi, near the, sing, uh, near the singular divisor. How does this look like? Well, it looks exactly in, in this way. There is a piece which is independent of this coordinate z, and when we approach the uh, singular divisor, the relevant parts are in this exponential, where n is the logarithm of this uh, monotomy matrix. So that's uh, that's a it's a strong state. It's a strong theorem, and it's a general theorem. So you can apply this to all kinds of Calabi-Yau manifolds in, of every dimension. Okay. So. Uh, this was the coordinate at z equal to zero. You remember there was the singular divisor, but we could also choose other coordinates t, which are the logarithm of z, and then we are at t equals to infinity, or imaginary part of t is at infinity, and then we are reaching this divisor. So this is the uh, expression for the local periods, completely general uh, and not fixed to a specific example. The next point is, that such a matrix N only exists if uh, this monodromy is of infinite order. What does infinite order means? That if I put T to the power K, I never get back to uh, T itself. So there exists no T which you can, uh, no K such that you can uh, come back and going around this so to come back to the original situation. Okay. Having the local periods, we can compute the local Kähler potential. And of course, now you see what I'm getting at. If I compute the Kähler potential, I can compute distances. Okay. So here is the local expression for the Kähler potential. It depends on this limiting vector, which I introduced here, which does not depend on z. And then we have a polynomial in T. Actually, this is a polynomial of degree D, and that's a uh, that's some, some letter I want you to remember. D is the 
the power of n which you have to which is the highest power which does not annihilate this kind of limiting period vector okay so you find that the killer potential is actually a polynomial with some coefficients and then there's exponentially suppressed terms and now there is an is a theorem and it's actually not uh, too hard to show this theorem is that uh, infinite distances, the, a point P is at infinite distance if and only if N does not annihilate um, A0. So in other words, there has to exist an N, so there has to exist a monotony matrix of infinite order, and it should not annihilate this A0, so D has to be bigger than zero, and then this point is at infinite distance. So that's... That's a very nice uh, algebraic way of connecting something very complicated, namely distances of a path, to something uh, algebraic, namely monotony. That's the first observation. Second observation is that the theorem tells you that if I have infinite distances, I have an approximate shift symmetry. Namely, the real part of T has these shifts, and the Kähler potential does not depend on it. So it, there is always an axion uh, at these points, at these infinite distance points. Okay. Of course, this is broken by these exponential corrections. So just to summarize, infinite distance yields infinite order monodromy and also this global symmetry. So now let's come to the uh, infinite tower of states. So what's the next step? The states, uh, uh, the states which we are considering are BPSD3 brains. They are given by some charges. The charges are the charges uh, which you measure by asking around which three cycles do the three brains wrap. Okay. And now the idea is to start with a single state and use this infinite order monotony to generate an infinite tower of states. And I told you that infinite distance has something to do with infinite order monotony, and this infinite order monotony generates infinitely many states. And this is this infinite orb orbit of charges. Okay, now we construct this uh, set of charges. Let's measure their mass. What's their mass? Their mass is given by the central charge. And the central charge we again can compute very explicitly. Why? Because we have the local form of the period. And it's given like this. So it, it has a polynomial upstairs and it has a, po a polynomial downstairs. I have dropped the higher terms because they will not be relevant. So now we can ask, when do these states become massless? Well, they become massless if the, uh, the denominator dominates when approaching the singularity. But in order to have this, we just have to ensure that this polynomial here truncates early enough so that the higher terms are absent. So we get some relations, some orthogonality relations of this limiting vector and the charges. Well, uh, we can do that and we can uh, see in the moment that such charges actually exist. If one finds such charges, one can then sit down and check how, do they, they, uh, uh, how does the mass behave in the proper distance. And what you find is that it actually behaves exponentially. So precisely as, project, uh, as predicted by this uh, uh, swampland distance conjecture. They are also exponentially decreasing uh, 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 states, but they are discussed in our paper. I will not go into the detail. Let me ask, uh, let me introduce another, just to get the excitement along, uh, some other mathematical structure which helped us or which allowed us to analyze this. I always told you, you see, this is a certain polynomial of a certain degree. Of course, it's a very, that's a very non-trivial statement because it means that we have to have control over the coefficients of these uh, polynomials. The right structure to get control over the coefficients is something which is called a mixed touch structure. 
And it's something which you introduce at the singular loci. So our idea is to adapt the spectrum to the singular lo uh, loci. So the charge state which we introduce, they are precisely adapted to this mixed Hodge structure. And then um, you can evaluate all these things which you need in order to uh, study the exponential behavior and to study the infinite distance. And just to point out that this is something really cool is that it's only very recently that mathematics so it's actually a, a one-year-old result after when there's a lot of activity going on uh, in uh, variations of hot structures. It's only recently that the identification of possible uh, singularity has been achieved for Calavia threefolds last year. So it, it's, uh, it's a very beautiful result and it essentially amounts to classifying possible ends which I wrote down, like these monotony matrices. I have to uh, hurry up. Okay. Having uh, found this, well, now we found an infinite tower of exponentially becoming light states, but we have a very explicit setup, so we can also uh, check everything. We can check how the fields, uh, how the distance behaves, how the masses behave, how the gauge coupling behaves, and everything near the singularity. Okay, now let me come to this conjecture. Well, I already mentioned the famous result that the periods near the conifold, they look like this, or the claim is that they look like this, because one has incorrectly or falsely integrated out a D3 band state. Falsely integrated out means that when I go really close to the conifold, which by the way is at finite distance, there is a, such, there is a single state becoming light, and I have integrate out and that's why I had this logarithmic structure. So now we can ask can we mimic this idea but instead of uh, using a single state we use this infinite tower of states which, which becomes light. So uh, let's set up the, uh, the computation. We have S massive scalars which have a mass which depends on the, our fields phi. Our fields phi are the fields on the complex structure moduli space. And we want to compute the Wilsonian effective action below some scale, some UV scale. Well, the one-loop corrections take these form. And I will assume for the moment, or I will assume for this argument, that these one-loop corrections are the dominant correct, uh, corrections for the argument. Okay. Of course, there could be classical correction which generate this behavior. And if these classical corrections are... Uh, the only relevant one, then, of course, this story does not uh, uh, hold. But let's assume that the one-loop corrections are the relevant uh, corrections. Well, which cutoff scale should I use? So the idea uh, which we uh, push, put forward is that one should use the so-called spaces scale, namely the scale which is the Planck mass divided by the number of uh, fields. Okay, so it kind of is a, is a scale which depends on the number uh, of fields. And we actually, since we are in such an explicit setting, um, we, we actually provide evidence that this is the right thing to do. Because, of course, with BPS states, we can, stack, uh, we can check stability. We can check at which scale do these BPS states become unstable. And we do that in the paper. I cannot discuss it here. But you uh, actually that this uh, it gives a very nice uh, uh, a match to the species scale. Okay, now let's perform the loop computation. Here is what we do. We have our um, moduli fields, which are massless, and then we have a tower of states, which start at some scale uh, uh, lambda zero, and then go to the v, uh, UV species scale, and this kind of going from one to the other, that's the monotony matrix. Okay, but everything is very explicit. Right? I can compute in this setting, so I can compute and I can look at the behavior of these various things. So in particular, I can compute how the spacing between the states behaves with distance. And I also can compute, for example, how the UV uh, cutoff behaves with distance. And what you find is if you go closer to the singularity, the cutoff comes uh, down. 
Yeah, so if you go closer to singularity, you have to integrate out more and more states. If you reach a singularity, you have to integrate out infinitely many states. So if you plug in everything into the one loop computation, we find a result. It matches precisely what the, the geometry tells you. So that's quite, uh, it's quite uh, an, an impressive evidence that this is not just a wild guess. And we actually also do, that, uh, do this for uh, the gauge coupling function and uh, find equally good evidence. Well, our, uh, this brings me to conclusion. Our study is very explicit, yeah, uh, using really the power of string theory. We introduced made mathematics, and uh, I think in this conference it's good to stress that because you appreciate that this is something really nice and cool to have at your hands. So this is just the beginning uh, because uh, there's much more to check. And th that usually also means that there is some underlying uh, deeper structure which has yet to be discovered. Well, we discussed infinite distance in complex structure mo modulus, but let me point out that there are old mathematical conjectures about this as well. Yeah. So there is something uh, really nice and deep to discover. Infinite order monotony, which is related to infinite distance, generates an infinite tower. And then we check that uh, field space metrics uh, matrices uh, or distances are actually generated by integrating out state. I did not talk about the gauge coupling function, but you can analyze it, and it relates actually to yet another interesting deep result in mathematics, namely to so-called growth theorems. How the gauge coupling function behaves near singularities is related in mathematics to growth theorems, and again we find match between the integrating out story and this growth theorem. So there are numerous generalizations, I leave them here, multivariable situations, the mathematics is there, but it's, it's, it's involved. Uh, Calabial fourfolds, recoupling limits, and kaluza klein reduction, many uh, interesting open problems which are really tractable and uh, uh, very nice. Thank you very much. Some quick questions for Thomas? I have two questions. One is, is there a way to actually implement your idea of um, getting the distance being infinite emergent in the sense that is there an effective moduli metric which is up to a given scale, which is, which is finite distance, and so you can recover everything from that? You want to start with a finite distance metric and yes. then, yeah, so that's, that's in some sense uh, 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 the, the idea. So, so we really start with some kind of leading order behavior, which, which could be a finite distance metric, and then step by step integrate out and we recover precisely the same scaling behavior as you would find for compute periods. So my question, can that be made precise? That is, can you say I will only include particles of a mass up to, let's say, m? Ah, yeah, yeah. And I will give a metric which is not, I mean, which may or may not be finite distance and then including these other ones will give you the exact correct metric. Is there something to... Yeah, yeah, so this is, uh, this is the kind of the setup which we are suggesting and we are doing this and we're doing some uh, first tests precisely of what you're saying. So we are setting up the... the, the this is what I just sketched very briefly in this... Uh, yeah. I, I, in this, right? So, so this, in the paper, it's in much more detail. So you really set it, you plug in the masses of the, of the states you integrate out, and you uh, do that step by step up to a scale which, uh, which we give by the stability scale of this BPS tower and so on. So indeed, the answer is yes, but it is for this setting where we have really control. I mean, in this paper which I mentioned, it was also conjectured that this is, uh, they, they agree with our conjecture, but they don't have these good tests. I and mean, we have very nice, uh, that this is actually not something stupid to do. Yeah. And the other question is, if you did type 2A instead of type 2B, <laughs> and then what would you say then? Yes, so that's something we are currently also thinking about. Uh, so, so, of course, in type 2A you can ask different things. You can either talk about Kähler moduli space, 
but then finding something like a mirror story to this, this is this you no, might I mean, not find I mean, as interesting right. because that's kind of no, obviously I'm about mirror. The complex structure, right. exactly. So now you have to talk about a complex structure, right. and then you're facing some issues because then it uh, re becomes really complicated. We are in hypermultiplet modular space, but the story should still hold. And we have we, we what story should hold? I mean, these would be instanton corrections, the uh, ones that you're calling particles. Exactly. So you, the, the story should hold in the sense that we we want to identify the states which uh, become light, and we want to check if these are either string states or instanton states. Uh, well, then, then of course, it doesn't fit as nicely with the swampland conjecture, the swampland distance conjecture, I should say. Uh, and uh, 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 so this is something which we are looking at at the moment. But I'm, I'm semi-optimistic that uh, we will be able to okay. identify. So this. in those cases, you would think that there are two issues. At finite distance, it's known that the singularity gets disappeared sometimes. So, like, Hanafold disappears as a singularity in the moduli space. And so, these infinite distances, I do not know how much they have been studied as far as instant corrections go. But uh, the four brains wrapped around the three cycle gives you light strings, at least. Yeah, exactly. And presumably, they're still, in some sense, light. And so, the tower of states would presumably be these states. I'm just curious to know whether that's... Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what is the sort of thing we are thinking about. And it's, it's very tricky, because then you, you have to think about strings... Uh, in the in the in the theory, so it's not anymore about particles, and uh, to be honest, I'm not sure how to set up the these, these loop computations. We are not sure how to set up the loop computations at this at this stage. So this is at the uh, early stage. But there are some of them which are dual to heterotic strings, in which the tree level heterotic string gives you the exact answer, not truthfully. So some aspects of it can be checked, presumably. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, you can. You can do what you're, uh, you're just indicating. I mean, we, 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 there are many string compactification which we understand reasonably well to, 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 to run such a story. And my conjecture uh, would be that we discover very similar structures in all of them, like these nilpotent matrices uh, which generate this, I didn't introduce the mathematics, but which generate this corresponding mathematics. That seems to be something important there. And why is it cool? Because this, maybe I should stress this one more, distance is something very, very path dependent. So, so if you ever have thought about these sort of conjectures, you realize that uh, it's not so clear what you mean by having some infinite path, right? I mean, you can do like this. And mathematicians find a way out of this by translating this into something uh, less uh, differential geometric, but into something more algebraic. I mean, uh, this was a general comment, not a comment. Yeah. Okay, so I suggest we keep it here, and you can harass Thomas during the coffee break. Yeah, please. Do. And then uh, we will continue with the colloquium after the coffee break.